I certainly didn't follow in my father's footsteps. I went to a building school and I was not very good at plumbing, carpentry, painting, but where I excelled myself was as a plasterer. Now, I don't mean wall plastering. I mean, you know, these fancy ceilings and mouldings and that sort of thing. I was therefore destined to go into a film studio as a plasterer, because that's where all the fancy work is done. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, I was working on a test running a giant moulding, and we ran out of plaster, which was a, a terrible thing to do. And I jumped off this very high bench and mixed up a load of plaster in a barrel. Needless to say, I had plaster up to my elbows. And when the test was finished, which was wonderful, I was encased in plaster. So I banged my hands on the edge of the sink, cracked the plaster and pulled it off. Now I've got hairy arms and it was all very painful. But as a result of that, I developed dermatitis on my arms and I lost the skin all the way from both elbows down to the wrist. And the doctor said to me, there's no way you can be a plasterer. And of course, my favourite line is, so as I couldn't become a plasterer, I became a film producer instead. In the days after the war, people like myself were called up for national service. And under law, when the two years service was completed, we had to be reinstated in our old job. Well, my original job was in Gainsborough Pictures and that had closed down when I came out. So I was put into the cutting rooms here, here being Pinewood Studios. And I was an assistant to the editor and very shortly afterwards I became a sound editor. Well, I once worked with a very famous film director of his time, a guy called George Pearson. And I remember he said to me, whatever you want to do in the film business make sure you know how to cut a picture because that is the basis of every trade in the film business. And that's what I did. I spent a long time in cutting rooms. I did like the work. I dubbed a lot of pictures and even though I said myself, I was very good at it. And I, I was employed by this company called Polytechnic Films and it was at the very beginning of commercial television and a lot of people were jumping in to make television series. And a man called Pete Collins approached me and said, I want to make a series about very strange people. A van arrived and an upright piano was brought in. And then a very, very tall stool, which you know, was too high to sit on. And then came in a poor little chap who had no arms. And he climbed up on the top of this stool and he played honky tonk piano with his feet and uh, uh, the producer said to me well these are the sort of things I want to film and I want to call them I want to call the series Pete's Freaks because it, his name was Pete Collins and I remember I said Pete's Freaks it sounds like a biscuit to me and so he immediately turned it into you've never seen this In fact, I travelled all over Europe and we filmed all sorts of things. A man called Kara Kavak, who in a circus used to hypnotise alligators just by doing this and they all froze. Thea Alba was a lady who fitted a piece of chalk on each of her fingers and thumbs and she could write the numerals from zero to nine simultaneously. She could also write a, a, a sentence starting at the back and working forward and the other one normally so that the two hands were working towards each other. There was a cyclist who cycled at 109 miles an hour and we were in a camera truck with a big baffle as a windbreak. Arthur Provis, who was my partner and cameraman, he said, I'm on, on a long focal length lens, Jerry. For Christ's sake, tell me where he is because it looks as if he's going to come down my throat. Another man used to run up to a tall building and scale it right up to the fifth floor with, with no, 
no assistance at all, and all sorts of crazy like things like that. And the last thing I'll tell you about was a man who lived in a bottle for a year. Everything was done on the cheap. Some of the members of the unit came by sea to Hamburg. What they weren't told was that it was a coal ship. It weighed about 900 tons and they all arrived ill. It was a great learning curve for me. But I think I must have been kind of ambitious because I got together with a few friends and we started our own production company. And along came a woman by the name of Roberta Lee, and under her arm she had 52 15-minute scripts. And she said, would you like to shoot this series? And we said, yes! I mean, we didn't even stop to think. And then she said, yes, they're children's shows and they've got to be made using puppets. At which point I nearly vomited on the floor. (laughs) 